Today, my sermon topic comes to you in the form of a question. And the question is this. What do you do when there's nothing you can do? What do you do when there's just nothing that you can do? And with that, I'm talking about situations and times in our life when you feel stuck, when you're caught in a situation that you just can't solve it, a problem that you just can't solve, a tension that you just can't resolve, or a deadlock that you just cannot unlock. Maybe it's a chronic illness in your life or maybe in the life of your family members. It is a chronic illness, meaning that it is something ongoing. Doctors cannot cure it, although they can treat it with some medicine to maybe to, to relieve the pain, but, but they cannot cure it. So it's ongoing. It will not kill you. The sickness will not kill you, but you may have to take medicine daily for the rest of your life. And you feel like, oh, I'm just so, so sick of it. But then you're stuck with it. You cannot solve it. You cannot get rid of it. Or maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe there's someone in your family that's not behaving the way that you want them to behave. Or maybe they're not treating you the way that you want them to treat you. And so it brought you lots of heartache, lots of pain, lots of hurts. You, you have put in so much hope into this relationship by yielding the fruit of hurts and pain instead. Or maybe it is a financial problem especially during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic and some people lost their job. But then maybe you are facing not just a temporary setback. Maybe you realize that, hey, it's something going to be quite long term. You, you just realize that, hey, you're not going to get back the kind of job, the kind of pay that you used to have. And so you're like stuck with it. Your dream for the future may have turned into a nightmare. And you feel quite dark, quite depressed, quite hopeless about what is ahead. You feel stuck. What do you do? What is your response? You know, for some people, they respond by running away. They quit. They give in. They give up. Maybe they stop the relationship. They kill the marriage. They destroy the family. Or maybe they try to drown themselves in drinks, in drugs. And of course, you know, that created even more problems, isn't it? Or maybe they try to numb themselves. They bury themselves in busyness. They become workaholic. Oh, just work and work so that they don't have to face the problem. They don't have to face the reality. They try to run away from it. Or some people, they resent it. They resent it. They feel angry. They feel bitter about the whole situation. Maybe their eyes turn green with envy and jealousy. You know, when you are stuck with a problem, then you begin to look around, you begin to compare. Especially, you look at social media. Don't do that. But then, you begin to look at it. You see, wow, no, the things that people posted, the photo, wow, like their life is so perfect, so successful, so happy. You know, look at the places that they are going to, the holiday, the staycation, the, the food, wow, the things they buy, like, oh, their life is so wonderful. And of course, you know that it's not true. People post those happy moments, but the things that they are going through, the problem that they face, they don't post it. Some people do, but... Oh, I'm saying that sometimes you be look around and you get angry, you get envy, envious, you get jealous, and you your eyes turn green, and then your eyes turn red also, turn red with anger, turn red with bitterness, turn turn red because you say, oh, this is not fair. How come it happens to me? You begin to blame others. You resented it, and so you blame others. Oh, it's their fault. Oh, you blame the society. Oh, you may even blame God. You say, God, where are you? Why do you allow this thing to happen to me? And some may even begin to question, God, are you real? Are you real? Do you care about me? Some people run, some people resent, 
And some people, they simply resign. Resign to so-called fate. Haven't you heard this quite a lot? People become pessimistic and fatalistic and they say, this is my fate. <laughs> you know, those, if you watch those Chinese drama, oh, this phrase often appears, isn't it? Oh, this is my fate. You know, I'm fated to live a life like that. Now, you know, for the Christian, they may sound more spiritual by saying, oh, this is God's will for me. That This is God's will for me to suffer. This is God's will for me to live life like that. But either way, it is basically giving up, become fatalistic and say, oh, that's it. Oh, so it becomes very grey, oh, very dark, oh, very depressed, very hopeless. And none of these responses, I must say that they are not very good, disp- they are not very good at responses. And there must be better responses from the Bible, amen? When we don't see any way, the Bible shows us the way. Hallelujah! Oh, the Word of God. The Word of God is the light unto our path. Amen. It's the lamp you know, of my feet. And, and so, when we don't see the way, God shows us the way through His Word. Amen. When all is dark around us, God should show the light. Show the light so that we know how to go, where to go, what to do. Hallelujah. And so, when we don't know what to do, the Bible teaches us what to do. Amen? And so we must go back to the Word of God and thank God. The Bible shows us different individuals, men and women of faith, who went through similar situations as us. That's why the Bible is never outdated. The Bible is always relevant. Amen? It may be written thousands of years ago, but it dealt with the issues that people today, in 2020, still face as well. And so, we find that there are individuals, men and women of faith, who trust the God, who believe in God, and they were stuck in certain situations as well. But what was their response? What did they do when there was nothing they could do? Nothing nothing that they could do in terms of getting rid of that problem, right? You could do this, do that, but the problem remains. And what was their response? What did they do? And one of those individuals was none other than the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, his experience, his testimony was recorded to instruct us and to inspire us. Amen? Hallelujah! Thank God! Thank God! The difficulty that he went through. He was stuck in the situation as well. But his response, the lesson he learned, become our instruction, amen, that we can learn, that we can grow, and it can inspire hope in us. It can raise our faith, hallelujah. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10. Let's look at what he says here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10. To keep me from becoming conceited, in other words, to become proud. To keep me from becoming proud because of these surpassing great revelations that was given me a thorn in my flesh. Ah, that's where this expression comes from. That it become a common expression being used even in the world, describing a situation that is a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, what did he say? Let's say together, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. What a wonderful and powerful promise of God. My grace is sufficient for you. And so Paul's response, he said, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. 
For when I'm weak, then I am strong. So let's look at what Paul went through. First of all, in verse 7, it talks about the suffering that he endured. The suffering that he endured. What suffering? Let's look at the nature of this suffering. Paul talks about a thorn in his flesh. What was the thorn in his flesh? Well, it may interest you to know that the, in the original Greek, the word translated thorns is more accurately translated as a stake, as in like a stake to hold down the tent. So it's not talking about a tiny splinter, you know, like sometimes you, you get a tiny splinter and it irritates you, it's a little bit painful. No, this is way more than that. Paul actually talked about it tormented me. So it's something sharp, it's something that is, that is painful, it's something that is tormenting, it's torturing, it's painful. So what was this thorn in the flesh? Paul didn't tell us, so we don't know, but many good guesses have been made. And some people think that it is a person, a person who stalked. Paul, you know, not just follow him, but stalk him. Wherever he went preaching the gospel, this person, the unbeliever, or would stalk him, harass him, persecuted him, and, and did all kinds of trouble for him. And so maybe it was a person. And there are others who think that maybe it's a physical illness, a sickness. What kind of sickness? Well, some guess maybe it was an epilepsy, or some say that maybe it was malaria, during those times, the region that Paul went around doing missionary work, high chance that, that he quite caught malaria. And some mentioned that, hey, in the book of Galatians, Paul talked about his eyesight problem. You know, he, he had eyesight problem, that's why you know, he wrote in such a large letter because he couldn't see. You know. Oh, maybe it was his eyesight problem. Either way, it was a problem. A painful problem that Paul was enduring. And this problem, it was painful, it was tormenting, and it was ongoing. That's the problem. It is ongoing. If it's just something for a short period, something that happened, and after that it was gone. At least maybe not so bad. But it was something that was ongoing. Ongoing. You know, so much so that it, you know, it is what we, we mentioned right at the start. Something that you just can't do anything about it. So what to do with it? So Paul had a thorn in his flesh. It was a problem, a painful problem that he was suffering. Now, where did this thorn come from? What is the source of this suffering? Paul mentioned, he described it as a messenger of Satan that tormented him. So, this thorn in the flesh came from the devil. But then Paul also talked about it was given to him so that he would not become proud. And so by the way he described it, he was describing it as a gift from God. So this sounds a little bit confusing. And on one hand, Paul mentioned that, hey, he's a messenger of Satan. On the other hand, he was talking about it as though it is a gift from God. So, if you get confused, I don't blame you. What is it actually? Is it from the devil or is it from God? Is it a curse or is it a blessing? Is it a pain, a punishment or is it oh, a delight? Is it a gift from God? What is it actually? Well, we know from the Bible that the devil comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. But Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. And so the devil is always out to steal the kill and to destroy. But don't forget that whatever the devil wants to do, he does not have the full freedom. He cannot just do anything he wanted, otherwise the whole humanity would have been wiped out long ago. There are certain limitations, restrictions placed on the devil by God. For example, if you go back and read the book of Job, chapter 1, when Job wanted to attack, not Job wanted to attack Satan, but Satan wanted to attack Job. Okay, you got it? Alright. When Satan wanted to attack Job, 
he got to get God's permission. Right? So the first round, God said, Alright, you can destroy his possessions, but not him. And so the restriction was placed on the devil, and that's what the devil could do. Then second round, because in the first round, Job stood firm. He kept his faith. He did not give up. He did not give in. He did not quit. And so the second round of temptation, second round of attack came. But then once again, the devil needed God's permission. And God said that, all right, you can touch him, but you cannot kill him. So Job was afflicted with sickness, skin problem and so forth. But the devil could not kill him. And thank God, Job triumphed. Hallelujah. Amen. His faith in God triumphed. Now, the point is this, that the devil wants to steal, to kill, to destroy, but only with God's permission. And when God allows it, God knew what he was doing. Amen. Aren't you glad God knows you and he knows what he is doing? He knows you. He knows how much you can take. He will not allow temptation to come to you that is beyond you. And when temptation comes, He will open a way. Just like a father knows how much the young child can take, can handle. Or when the child grows up, the father knows that his young man oh, can do so much more. So our Heavenly Father knows how much you can handle. And when He allows it, He allows it with a good purpose. When He allows it, it is to accomplish something good in your life. The devil meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God meant it for good. And God can turn it around for good. The devil wants to destroy you, but God will turn it around for your salvation. Oh, the devil wants to tear you down, but God will turn it around so that it will build you up so that you become a better person, so that you become a better Christian, so that you become a triumphant, a victorious Christian in the Lord. And so, although this comes from the devil, but it is within the permission of God. God allows it for a good purpose. That's why Paul can say that, hey, it is a gift from God. And therefore, it no longer becomes just something that he endured, like, oh, grit his teeth and endure. It becomes something that he embraced. He embraced it as a gift from God. He embraced it as something that will work out something good within him. And with that change in his attitude, with a change in his understanding, he was able to triumph, overcome, conquer that suffering, conquer that tone in the flesh. So what is the purpose? In this case, within the life of Paul, what is the purpose of this suffering? What is the purpose of this thorn in the flesh? Paul revealed it to us. Or rather, God revealed it to him. And he let us know. Twice it was mentioned that the thorn was there so that he would not become conceited. So that he would not become proud. Now, you must go back and refer to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 6. We read 7 to 10. If you go back and read verses 1 to 6, Paul talks about the great revelation that he experienced, that he encountered. He was taken to paradise. He was taken to heaven. Now, you go back and read, you will discover that Paul talks about it in the third person. He talked about a man. You know, about 14 years ago, a man was caught up to the paradise. All Bible scholars agree that Paul was talking about his own experience. But he has learned the lesson of humility. It's not something that he wanted to boast about. So instead of talking about, hey, you know, I got this great revelation today, today, you know, someone who got such a revelation who have gone around the whole world, isn't it? Declaring, hey, I saw, you know, this and that and that. But Paul talked about it as, as though it was someone else. So there was this man who encounter such great revelation whether bodily or out of the body um, I don't know because it was so it was so real Paul wasn't even sure was he taken up bodily 
or was it his spirit went out to heaven? Nevertheless, he went to paradise. He went into the presence of God and he saw things, he heard things that God did not permit him to share. But the point is this, because of that great revelation, that's why in verse 7, he talks about God allowed this thorn to take place so that he will not become proud. He will not become prideful because of this. He will not become something that he boasts about. So there was a purpose in Paul's life in encountering that suffering. And this is the purpose that all of us must learn as well. The purpose of keeping us humble and dependent on God. We need it. Not because God is, is, is so high and mighty, He wants to press us on. No, no, no. But this is something that we need. We need to learn humility and dependence on God as well. Because this is what we need. Some people may say that, hey, but I'm not prideful in terms of my personality. I'm a very humble guy. Watch it when you say it like that. <laughs> you know? Oh, I'm so humble. Well, that speaks of pride to begin with. But also, you see, pride is not just a personality or character issue. Pride is basically self-sufficiency. Pride is basically living life independent of God. Pride is living life independent of God. When we live life on our own, thinking that, hey, I can do it, I know what to do, I, I can do it, I can solve it. When there is no dependence on God, we are becoming prideful. And watch it, because that pride will bring downfall. That pride will destroy you. We need God. Simple as that. We need God. We are not self-sufficient. We need God. We depend on Him. And so, talking about the purpose of suffering, we tend to ask some wrong question, wrong as in, in the wrong direction. One question that we ask is, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong to deserve this suffering? What have I done wrong to deserve this thorn in the flesh? Well, maybe we did do something wrong. If you realize that you've done something wrong, you've committed a sin, what do you do? Repent. Make it right. Correct the mistake. Of course. But the point that I want to bring to attention is this, that suffering, thorn in the flesh, may not come because of something you have done. In Paul's case, it wasn't something wrong that he has committed. And so likewise, very often, suffering may come simply because we live in a fallen world. We live in an imperfect world. We grow old. Our family members, they grow old. And as we grow old, oh, we got all kinds of sickness, all kinds of pain. You know, our mental faculty begin to degenerate. And so in the midst of all this, it can bring a lot of pain, heartaches. So it's not necessary that you've done something wrong. But like I said, if you realize you've done something wrong, make it right. Correct it. Repent. But then, don't go into self-condemnation. Because if you keep condemning yourself, say, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? Then, you will never overcome it. Because you'll be so depressed, so discouraged, and you'll be, you'll be you know, chasing around the wrong path, wrong direction. You can't solve it. Because you're trying to dig up, what have I done wrong? And you will not find the answer. A second question that people tend to ask is, well, is it because I don't have enough faith? Well, when you're faced with a situation, there'll be some sincere, well-meaning people will come around and tell you that, hey, if you got you know, enough faith, you won't get this problem. If Paul knows my teaching, he won't have the thorn in the flesh. There are people who actually say that, you know. Oh, if you've got enough faith, you won't get sick. If you've got enough faith, you won't have this problem. No, this is not true. I don't believe in that teaching. Well, of course we need faith. Our faith must grow. But the point is this. Having great faith doesn't mean that everything will be smooth sailing. Paul, did he have great faith? Come on. You know, I think he was the greatest Christian, isn't it? 
I mean, he wrote half of the New Testament, right? Among the believers of Jesus, he was the most famous in a good way, right? He was a great apostle, Paul, mightily used as a missionary, reaching out to the Gentile world. He was a man of faith. And talk about revelation, come on, he has so much revelation, vision, caught up into heaven. He was a man of great faith. And yet, he had a thorn in the flesh. And you go back and read chapter 11. He described the hardship that he went through. How many times he shipwrecked. How many times he was beaten. He was, he was, he was um, uh, 39 lashes. Five times. He was stoned. You know, uh, in, they wanted to kill him. He was beaten with rod. He was in prison. I mean, talk about all this hardship. And he was a man of faith. So if you think that, hey, if you have faith, oh, everything smooths your leg. It's just simply not true. On the other hand, I'm not saying that, oh, we must all go through all this suffering. As I say, God knows how much you can take. And when God allows it, He allows it with a great purpose. And when He allows it, He gives you a great promise, a great promise as well. We'll discover what that promise is. But right now, there is a purpose. The thorn is not something that is meaningless. Because God can use something bad and turn it for good. God can use something evil and accomplish a wonderful, good purpose in your life. So it's not because of a lack of faith that Paul encountered problems. And I must point this out to you because so many people get discouraged. And they're saying, oh, maybe my faith is not strong now. Oh, my faith is not strong now. Oh, then how? Then how? Oh, I'm not like so and so. My faith is not strong. And, and so they... Again, they go down the trail of despondency, the trail of discouragement. But the issue is not because of a lack of faith. The issue is understanding God, trusting Him, and then, hey, even faith so small like a mustard seed, it can move mountain. Hallelujah. So the issue is whether you know God, whether you trust God, whether you walk with God. And of course, then it brings to the, the real question, then why do I have to go through this? And this is a question of purpose that we just talked about. In Paul's case, the purpose was to keep him humble and dependent on God. And when he is dependent on God, he could do so much more for God. Hallelujah. And so likewise, we need that. We need that. All of us. I see you know, COVID-19 as a thorn in the flesh of all humanity. Don't you, don't you think so? Yeah, it's a thorn in the flesh. Of course, sadly, many people have died. But in terms of fatality rate, it's not that, that, that high as compared to some sickness. Okay? So majority survive. But then, it's a thorn in the flesh. You know, how you wish it's gone, but it's there. It's still here. But it taught us how weak we are, isn't it? Before COVID, oh no, everybody thinks, hey, I can do all things, I can do this, I can do that. And then a COVID comes. Suddenly, there's nothing we can do. Right? All the political power, all the military power, all the financial power in the world couldn't overcome it. It taught humanity a lesson that we are not that strong as we think we are. That's why we cannot boast in our own strength. We cannot boast in our own ability. And you cannot boast in the things that you dependent upon. The other night, I went to visit one of our members and, and so we were just chit-chatting and he was telling, t telling me that you know, one of his colleagues, because they, they work in the airline industry, su providing support, and so he was telling me that the colleague was telling him that before that, the colleague actually said that, hey, we're in the airline industry. This is the most secure, the most stable industry. Nothing will happen. But then, COVID comes. Airplanes are not flying. And suddenly, no job. And so the point is that, hey, we, we, we thought we can depend on this. We thought this is so sure. This is so secure. Then, suddenly, we realize that no, they are not secure. There's nothing secure stable about the things around us. We cannot depend on them. We cannot depend on ourselves. We need to come back to God in humility. 
independent and say, God, I need you. And that's what the thorn in the flesh did for Paul. The thorn in the flesh taught Paul the lesson of dependence on God. Now, in our case, we need to learn this lesson. Or maybe there's other areas as well. Without the thorn in the flesh, we may think that we are so good, we are so great. We may think that we are such a patient person. We may think that we have so much love. But then, something happened. Then we realize, oh, actually I'm quite impatient. Actually, my love is quite, quite not enough. Actually, oh, my peace is actually very fragile. And so in the midst of this, may we learn it. May we learn the lesson. May we seek God's help so that we develop, so that we become a better person. You see, God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. That's right. God is more concerned about our character than our comfort. Having a thorn is very uncomfortable. But if it's needed, God will allow it so that our character can be built up, so that we can be a better person, be a better Christian. Then you can truly walk in the blessing and the abundant life of the Lord. Jesus Christ. And so there is a purpose. There is a purpose in the thorn in the flesh. And once we realize that, then let's see what Paul did about it. As Paul learned the lesson in verse 7, he endured suffering and he learned the lesson. And then in verse 8, it tells us the supplication that he ensued. The supplication, in other words, the prayer that he made. When there's nothing you can do, there's still one thing you can do. You still can pray. Amen? You still can pray. In verse 8, let's read verse 8 once again. Here it says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. You see, the thorn in the flesh drove Paul to his knees. It drove him to prayer. And so prayer is a great fulfillment of the lesson on humility and dependence on God. Because when you pray, you're acknowledging that you can't make it. You need God. You're acknowledging that you're weak. You need God's strength. You're acknowledging that, hey, you don't know what to do. You need God's help. So prayer is an expression of dependence on God. And so Paul prayed. And look at how he prayed. He prayed, he prayed, and he prayed. Here it says, he prayed three times, pleaded with God. Now maybe most of us here, when we encounter those situations where we are stuck with a problem, most of us have prayed, isn't it? He said, Pastor, but I did pray also. Nothing happened. Yes, we did pray. But how did we pray? Did we seriously, really pray? Paul prayed. Not just one time, but three times. He cried out to God. He pleaded with God. And here is a reminder of the power of prayer. When there's nothing we can do, we can still pray. Amen? Prayer is the answer. Hallelujah. When we don't have the answer, prayer is the answer. Prayer is the answer. Why? Because God answers prayer. Hallelujah. He still does. He still answers prayer. Prayer works even when nothing seems to work. Prayer makes a difference even when we can't see the difference. You may say, well, I pray but nothing happened. I pray like no difference. I want you to know that prayer is making a difference. Prayer works because God is at work when you pray. Not like the song that we sang in past week. Even when I don't see it, God is moving. Even when I don't feel it, God is moving. He never stopped working. Hallelujah. Indeed. But we must pray. We must come to Him. We must cry out to Him. We pray. He moves. He works. Even when we don't see it. Even when we don't feel it. But God is 
is at work. You can trust Him. He knows what He is doing. And He knows you. And He's working on something good on your behalf. And look at the way Paul prayed. He prayed specifically, first of all. Very specific. He didn't just say, Oh God, please bless me. Now, we often pray that prayer. I mean, it's good to ask God to bless you, but we can be more specific. In this case, Paul, he prayed, God, please remove the tongue from me. Specifically. Remove this problem. Remove this issue. He was specific. And we need to learn to pray in that manner as well. Be specific. Tell God what you needed, what you wanted. Secondly, he prayed earnestly. Here he says, he pleaded with God. Hallelujah. In other words, he poured his heart into his prayer. He poured his passion, his emotion into his prayer. That's why I asked this question before. Can your prayer move your own heart? If it cannot even move your own heart, can it move the heart of God? No, I'm not talking that, I'm not saying that, oh, with our cry, with our tears, with our emotion, that, that we, we, we move God because of that. But the point is that, that when we pray, we pray earnestly, with all our heart, with all our passion, with all our emotion. That's what the Bible teaches us to pray. Paul pleaded with God. And then Paul prayed persistently. Persistently. Here he says, three times I pleaded with God. Now, I want you to know that the three times, obviously, it is not like, oh, okay, morning I pray one time, oh, one time ready, okay. Lunch time, oh, pray another time, two times. No, I believe the way Paul prayed, the way he pleaded with God, more accurately is talking about three seasons of prayer. That he come before God. Oh, no, maybe the first season, he fasted and prayed, maybe for the entire week. But then he didn't get the answer from God. God did not answer him. God did not tell him. And so he went into a second season of prayer. Maybe this time he prayed and fasted for 40 days. Who knows? But again, he didn't get the answer. And then what did he do? He, he once again, he entered into a third season of prayer. And this time, God spoke to him. God revealed. He heard from God this time. He got his answer and he rested. He rested from his struggle in this suffering. And so this is how the Apostle Paul prayed. And this is what we can learn to pray. The supplication that ensued. The prayer that we make before God. And because of his prayer. He got the answer finally. And that brings us to verse 9 and 10, which tells us the sufficiency that he embraced. Hallelujah. The sufficiency that was given to him in response to his supplication regarding his suffering. Let's look at verse 9 and 10. In verse 9, the famous verse, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul's prayer was answered. Thank God! But not in the way that he expected. And isn't it so true? We pray, and you thought that, Oh, God didn't answer prayer, but maybe He did. Except that He answered in a way that is not according to how you wanted it not according to how you expected Him to do. You see, God always answers prayer. Can we say a good amen to that? It's true. God always answers prayer. But the answer can come in one of these forms. He can answer, yes. Well, this is the one that we like. Yes. So, I got it. Or He may say, no. For good reason. He rejected your request. Maybe you prayed wrongly. He said, God, let me strike 40. You know? <laughs> I'm sure you know that you don't do that. But then you pray something amiss and, and God said, no, cannot. Or maybe He may answer you, wait. Wait doesn't mean no. Wait simply means wait. That means 
I will give it to you, but not right now. I will allow a certain time for you to grow or for certain situation to develop. So I will give it to you, but you wait. Be patient. So yes, no, wait. But then there is a fourth possibility, which is, yes, I'll give something to you, but not according to what you wanted. It's something that is different. Different from what you wanted. Oh, this is the one that Paul got. He prayed for the thorn to be removed. God didn't remove the thorn, but God gave him something else. God gave him all sufficient grace. God gave him the answer, but in a different form, in a different manner. Instead of removing the thorn, God gave him all sufficient grace to sustain him to strengthen him so that he can stand up under the thorn, so that he can endure the pain, so that he can overcome the pain. You see, to remove the burden from our shoulder, there are two ways. So imagine, I'm carrying this heavy load on my shoulder. There are two ways to lighten the load. One way is to decrease the weight of the burden. Right? Take away half of the load, maybe. De or remove it all together to decrease the weight of the burden. That's one way. A second way is to increase the strength of my shoulder. Once the strength of my shoulder is increased, now that load is no longer a burden. It's no longer heavy to me because now I'm so strong. It becomes something light. It becomes something easy. So there are two ways. And when God says, I give you grace, I give you strength, this is the second way. Instead of removing the load, God says, I increase your strength. And this is a better way most of the time. You know why? Because if God simply removed the load, reduced the weight, or removed the stone, next time, another load will come. Another thorn will appear. And then you are still weak and you still, oh God, please remove it. But in this case, now that the shoulder has been strengthened, now that the heart has been strengthened with grace, next time, another thorn comes around. Another look comes around. Hey, you're no longer the same you. You are a stronger you now. Hallelujah. You have greater strength. You have greater faith. You are greater prepared to overcome new situations. And that's why God answered differently at times. Because He wanted us to be strengthened. He wanted us to mature. He wanted us to grow. So that we learn how to fish. And not just given a fish. Or put it another way. You know, God saves us two ways. One, He saves us from trouble or He saves us in the midst of trouble. He can save us from trouble, meaning He prevents the trouble from happening altogether. Second way, He saves us in the midst of the trouble, in other words, He allows us to go through it, but He protected us, He walked with us, He gives us strength, so that in the midst of the trouble, we emerge victorious. Classic example, Daniel in the lion's den. God could save him from the lion's den altogether. Maybe God can change the situation, right? so that finally the king said, okay, Daniel, you don't have to go into the land's land. And we will have said, oh, praise God. Amen. I mean, it's true. I mean, so thank God. Huh, I'm safe from the land's land. Oh, thank God. It's a great testimony. But a second way is to save him in the midst of the land's land, which is what God did. Daniel was sent to the land's land. He spent a night staycation. Free of charge. Uh, don't need to pay, you know. Wow, you know, in the lion's den, got big soft toy, you know, warm, you know. Oh, cushion to lie around. But you know the danger, right? <laughs> Obviously. And it was a miracle. God saved him in the midst of it. 
God sent His angel, shut the mouth of the lions. They all put on the special face mask. They could not open their mouth to bite Daniel. They could not eat him. They could not kill him. And the king spent the whole night sleepless, whereas Daniel had a good night's sleep. And the daybreak, oh, the king cried out, Daniel, are you still alive? They don't say, oh, oh, I just woke up, you know. Time for breakfast. <laughs> And so Daniel was delivered. He came out and the king ordered those who framed Daniel, those who sabotaged Daniel, those people were thrown in the lion's den and those lions, they've been hungry the whole day, see but cannot eat, right? They can see Daniel cannot eat. Now that those people were thrown in, immediately they pounced on them and tore them apart and eat them up. And so it was a miraculous salvation from God. Now between the two ways of salvation, Tell me, which was a greater miracle? Which gave God greater glory? Obviously, it was the second way, isn't it? I mean, if God prevented Daniel from going in the lions, then it's still a miracle. But to preserve him in the midst of the lions, that was a greater miracle. And he gave God the greater glory so that the king acknowledged it and said, Hey, Daniel, no God can do that. Your God is the true God. Your God is a great God. Or again, take the example of the three Hebrew children, the three Hebrew young men. They refused to bow down to the golden idol of King Nebuchadnezzar. And God saved them. How? Two ways. One, God could have prevented them from going into the fiery furnace, right? Maybe something you know, happened and in the end, Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, you don't need to go to the fiery furnace. And all of us say, oh, praise God, hallelujah, He saved me. Thank God for that. It's still a miracle. But God chose to let them go through it. God saved them in the midst of the fiery furnace. And you know the story. What happened? They went in. The furnace was heated up seven times, so much so that those, those gods who, who were in charge of throwing Daniel, I mean, not Daniel, the three Hebrew young men to the fiery furnace, those gods got killed because it was so hot. They got nearly, zoom, gone, dead. And so how could they survive? But they did. Indeed, the king actually saw. I thought I did all the three men to be thrown away. How come I see four? Who's the one who sneaked in, you know? Never do the safe entry. Never do the social distancing. And so there were the fourth man. Who was he? It was the Lord who manifested himself, walked among his people. And so the king said, Oh, please come out. Please come out. And they came out. They came out. And they were unharmed. There wasn't even the smell of fire on their body. And, and so we always say, the only thing that got burned up was the rope that tied them up, it was gone. They were free. Hallelujah. God did a miracle. And between the first way and the second way, once again, which was a greater miracle? Which gave God the greater glory? Obviously, it was the second way. Having to go through it, and yet God was with them. God protected them. It was a greater miracle and it gave God the greater glory. Hallelujah. And so, and so, when we pray, God may not give us according to how we wanted it. We say, please remove this situation. Get rid of this guy or, or get rid of this problem. Get rid of this sickness. Yes, God does do that. He does. There are times when God healed instantaneously. Thank God. So pray. That's what, that's what Paul did. He prayed. He prayed spe specifically. Remove the thorn. And there are times when God does that as well. But there are also times when God chooses a second way. And when He chooses a second way, that's what I want to tell you. My brother, my sister, don't be discouraged. Don't doubt. When God chooses a second way, He knows what He is doing. Amen. He knows you. He loves you. He cares for you. And when He chooses a second way, for sure, you are going to experience a greater miracle. You're going to give God the greater glory. Hallelujah. And your life is going to be better transformed. Hallelujah. You will grow to be a better person, a stronger person in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're better equipped 
to face other storm, to face other other thorns. Haven't you noticed that? Like, because you never grow and learn, then similar situation keep happening. It's just like, why, how come this always happened to me? Why? Because you are still weak. You never learn the lesson. And so, every time you depended on God to remove the problem, thank God you depended on God. But the point is that God wanted you to grow as well. And once you have grown, the thorn will no longer be a thorn. His grace is sufficient. There will be sufficient grace, sufficient power, sufficient strength for you to overcome it. So much so that, hey, the thorn will no longer cause pain will no longer be an issue. And as you move on in the Lord, guess what? It will even be removed. The thorn will even be removed. But before that, learn to trust God. Amen? Learn to have faith in God. Learn to depend on Him for His all sufficient grace. That's why Paul said, I know that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. It's a paradox. But simply because when he is weak, when he acknowledge that he can no longer trust in himself, depend on himself, when he is weak, then he can receive God's strength. And when God's strength comes upon him, then of course he becomes strong. And so he acknowledges his insufficiency in order to receive God's sufficiency. Today, do you believe that you are insufficient? He said, if you don't believe, you will not experience the all-sufficiency of God. If you're sitting there, hey, I can do it. I know how to do. Thank God. God has given us a good mind. God has given us many talents. But ultimately, don't ever forget that we need Jesus. Amen? We need Jesus. Life is so fragile. Life is so unpredictable that if you just depend on yourself, a COVID can come. A storm can come. A shipwreck can happen. That's why we walk with Jesus all the way. So, remember, when the thorn comes into your life, don't complain. Complain doesn't save you. Hallelujah. Amen. Complain doesn't save you. Don't doubt. Doubting will destroy you. Don't complain, don't doubt, and don't be discouraged. What do you do instead? you still can pray. Amen? You still can pray. You still can hear from God. God will speak. God will give the answer. God will give the revelation. And when you pray, God will give the strength. God will give the grace. And God will show you His purpose and His promise. And the promise is His all-sufficient grace is made available to you. Hallelujah. And so, we can trust in Him. Amen? He will not let you down. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And so, come to Jesus. Let your heart be strengthened by His amazing grace. Hallelujah. And you'll discover that it's more than sufficient. It's more than sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. Isn't it wonderful that that grace is personalized? God say, my grace, his, his grace is sufficient for who? For you. Amen? It's not a generic one, you know. Okay, uh, just one type. You know, all, all of you use the type. Uh, you just fit into it. No, no. It's tailor-made. God say, my grace is sufficient for you. Personalized for you. And it's a powerful grace. Hallelujah. He does what? Hey, my power is made perfect. In your witness. It's personalized. It's powerful. And it's plentiful. It's more than enough. Hallelujah. You don't have to worry that, hey, it will run dry. Like the fish doesn't have to worry that, hey, I will drink up the water in the ocean. Fear not. Open your mouth wide and drink. There's enough in the ocean. Amen. Or the man who went up to Bukitima Hill and said, Oh, I've been breathing so much air. What happened if I breathe up all the oxygen in, the, in Singapore? How? Huh? 
Piano! <laughs> keep breathing! Keep breathing! There's still enough oxygen. Hallelujah! All that, you know, little mouse who was in Joseph's green stock, you know, during the seven years of plentiful. And he started worrying, oh, what happened if, 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 if all this grain finish up, huh? Fear not. During the seven years of abundance, there's more than enough for you, tiny little mouse. Hallelujah. And so for you, oh, tiny little ones in the household of God, there's more than enough grace, more than enough provision from God to supply, to strengthen, to bless you, to see you through. Hallelujah. More than enough. More than enough. Praise God. And so, brothers and sisters, what do you do when there's nothing you can do? When you can't remove the tone, when you can't remove the situation, when you can't change that person, what do you do? Well, at least one thing you can do, you still can pray. You still can pray. We still can pray and we must pray. And what to pray for? Well, obviously, by all means, pray that the tone be removed. Okay? You can go and pray for that. Put your curtsy. It's okay. You can, you can, like what Paul did. He prayed that the tongue be removed. But at the same time, now that Paul has shown us the lesson he learned, we can learn it now. While we can pray for the tongue to be removed, let's pray also for grace to be made available to us. Amen? Let's pray also for the all-sufficient grace of God to be made available, to rest upon us. And you know what? With the grace of God, with the grace of God, we don't just endure the pain. We can embrace it, hallelujah, and grow in it, hallelujah. And we are going to grow beyond it. Amen. And one day, the thorn will no longer be a thorn. Hallelujah. So we can pray. And in closing on to refer us to the prayer of Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you realize that it was a similar situation? At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed how many times? Three times. What did He pray? He said, Father, if it be possible, please remove this cup from Me. What cup? The cup of suffering. The cup of the cross. He said, Father, please remove it. Like what Paul did. Lord, please remove the thorn. Like what we did. Oh God, Please solve this situation. Please take me out of this problem. But did God the Father answer Jesus' prayer according to how He wanted? He didn't. Nevertheless, notice what Jesus prayed. He said, Nevertheless, yet not as I will, but as you will. In other words, He was submissive to the will of the Father. He said, not my own will, but your will. God, do as you see fit. And, the, and God the Father chose to let Jesus go through the cross. But when he go through the cross, the second way, God gave him strength, God gave him grace so that he can go through it. Hallelujah. And thank God, we must all thank God that God the Father did not answer Jesus' prayer according to the first way. The first way is, okay, remove the cup. Didn't go through the cross, and today we will not be here. Today there will be no salvation for us. Thank God that Paul, God did not answer Paul according to the first way, according to what he wanted, remove the thorn. If God did that, today we wouldn't know this great promise, the promise of all sufficient grace. We would learn this great lesson. And so as hard as it may seem to be, let me say this, that if God chose to answer us according to the second way, if God say no to our first request, we must thank God too. We must thank God because we can have faith, we can trust God that there is a great purpose that's for our good. At the same time, there is a wonderful promise of His all-sufficient grace. And just as what we see in the life of Paul, as what we see to the Lord Jesus Christ, when God didn't say yes to our first request, it also means that someone else will be blessed as a result. 
We're going to have the grace to go through this and then we'll meet someone who is going through similar situation and we'll be able to comfort them, encourage them, show them God's way. His all-sufficient grace. And so, not only we become a better person, we become a better blessing, a greater blessing to others. As a result, as a result, we experience greater miracle. God gets greater glory. Amen. So when there's nothing you can do, you still can pray. And you'll receive the all-sufficient grace of God. Amen. Shall we stand in prayer? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we come before you in prayer. Lord, this precious truth that we learned today, it is not an easy truth. It is hard truth because on our own, we acknowledge that we all love to receive the first way, to get the problem removed, to, to see the thorn disappear. And we thank God that you know us and you know what is best for us and you know what you are doing. And so, although there may be time when we have to go through it, but one thing for sure, as we learn today, we're going to cry out to you. We're going to pray specifically. We're going to pray earnestly. Pray persistently. Pray until something happens. Pray until you answer us, O oh God, with your personal revelation. And Lord, we know that we shall receive all sufficient grace. Oh, so that we are strengthened. Oh, so that we can overcome. So that we can stand up in the midst of the pain, of the suffering, of the situation. And so, Lord, we trust you. We submit to you. We ask of you, give us that grace. Give us that grace so that in whatever situation, we will discover that your grace is sufficient to see us through. Your grace is sufficient to strengthen us, to transform us for your glory. And so, we pray for each other. Oh, we encourage each other. Lord, you see the different things that, oh, my brother, my sisters, they are going through. Oh, the pain and the heartache, the weariness that they are facing right now when they feel so weak. But I pray, oh God, Lord, that you encourage them. Encourage them. Encourage them. Let your word come in. Bring them hope. Bring them faith. Bring them love so that they know that you are still with them. You are walking with them. And Lord, they will not fail because you are with them. Hallelujah. You will see them through. And so I bless my brother, I bless my sister with your grace, with your strength, oh God. Hallelujah. And God, we know that together we shall walk victoriously with you in our life, in our midst. And Lord, we pray also for our family members, for our friends who are yet to know you. We pray for those who will receive this message through the video, through the internet. We pray for those who are yet to know you. That together we'll realize that how much we needed Jesus Christ. How much we needed God's salvation. That deep from deep within our heart will cry out to you and say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Please change my life because only you can forgive. Only you can change my life. And with that cry, indeed, Jesus, you come into our life. Oh, you save us and you transform us in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, together, together, we pray Oh God, that we will come through the valley of the shadow of death. And we will enter into the abundant feast that you have prepared in store for us. 
So I speak blessing to your people. I speak blessing to your church. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. As we close the service, why don't we turn around, greet one another, bless one another, and tell them, God's grace is sufficient for you.